I am Dracula. There was one thing he could do in English. He did it brilliantly. It is that hypnotic stare with the eyes and everything and the exaggerated line readings. Good night. Mr. Renfield. Everyone thinks he played Dracula lots and lots of times. He only played it twice in his career. All the Draculas since are in the image of Lugosi. It has some of the great lines of horror cinema and nobody delivered them like Lugosi. Bart man! Bart beast! <laughs> he loved acting. He loved giving audiences what he had. You have harnessed its power to destroy. All dead! But who would want us dead? Do you want me to tell them? He had that special quality, which is a movie star quality. He was bigger than life. What a funny looking man. He's a show in himself. Did you notice his accent? I wonder where he comes from. Lugosi defined the horror star of the early 1930s because, first of all, he was attractive. He was seductive. There was nothing repellent about him. He was able to sort of hypnotize, lure the audience into being on his side, actually seeing the world through his own vampiric eyes. I never saw a performance where Lugosi didn't look like he was giving it his all. I mean, he was a very robust actor, and he always came through. Bela Lugosi is the most intense movie star in the history of motion pictures. He had to be a horror icon. For one who has not lived even a single lifetime, you are a wise man, Ben Helsing. Well, a horror icon is more than just a great actor. He's a magician. He's a conjurer. And he's able to work a magic on an audience in which not only do they believe what he's doing, despite whatever the makeup might be or the crazy story or whatever, but is able to actually enchant the audience. Bela Lugosi was the consummate expressionist talkie actor because he played every moment like it was important. We think that's what vampires look like. They need to have the widow's peak. They, they need to have that bone structure, that, that physiognomy. It's only the look because that's the look Bella had. He was a very warm, very generous person. He was somewhat shy because of, his, of the language problem and because he always felt that he was sort of an outsider in the Hollywood colony. There's something about the way he reads the lies and the way he talks, and, and the fact that horror as a discreet Hollywood genre uh, really only begins in the early 30s means that it's a talky genre, isn't it? And I think that the fact that these monsters talked was one of the, the, the big things that set them out. The spider spinning his web for the unwary fly. The blood is the light, Mr. Renfield. A greater part of the rest of being a horror, horror star is just being typecast in horror films, making a lot of horror roles. And I don't know if it's anything anyone would have chosen. Universal City was looking for a way to make its name in Hollywood. It had been around for years. And Junior Lemley wanted to make his mark in movies, and he loved horror films. And he wanted to make Dracula. His father thought he was crazy. The novel is so convoluted. It's a most extraordinary piece of writing structurally with, with um, you know, notebooks and journals and recording machines. What Dracula the film does, which in a way is a travesty, people would argue, it simplifies it so that the whole, the essence of Dracula emerges very clearly. It was very daring. All the story advisors were telling them, don't do it. This is madness to make this film. But Junior was determined, he went ahead, and of course the trick was they had to find exactly the right actor to play Dracula. When the, the part of Dracula come, comes up, I, mean, I know Lugosi is by no means the, the first choice. They were thinking, of course, of Lon Chaney Sr., but Lon Chaney Sr. died from throat cancer. Then they were looking around for a likely Dracula, and uh, not an easy part to cast. I think the obvious choice was Conrad Veidt, who was, had a solid background in making that kind of movie in Europe. You know, he'd been in Caligari, Hands of Orlac. Conrad Veidt didn't want to do it because he wasn't comfortable with the language, and he had moved back to Germany. Now, he would have been possibly a perfect Dracula because he would have looked much more like the Stoker character, perhaps. Universal had drawn up a list of other actors who could play the part, and you know, some of them were people you've never heard of now. Looking around, you, can, you could probably have found many uh, a person who would have been better suited. Lugosi got the part because he'd played it already. He was the, like the default 
casting choice. They just got the guy who'd done well on Broadway. He let everybody know he was desperate for this part of Dracula. I really, really want to play Dracula. So, I mean, when they actually made the offer, they realised they'd got him over a barrel. <laughs> and uh, they got him for uh, 3,500, I think, for seven weeks' work or something. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. Degosi worked in Hungarian State Theatre in Budapest. He was a well-practiced stage actor, uh, which gave him technique and presence. He was the first real, real person to, to, to leave the stage and, and bring theatricality to, to the horror field. What it feels like he's grabbing is the locus of attention for what both before him in, in literary and, to a lesser extent, dramatic terms, and looking ahead in cinematic terms. Lugosi, as Dracula, was this demon lover. He was this Valentino from hell. He was this seducer. The mannerisms that he brought to it and the supposed story of him learning the lines phonetically, which gave him a sort of a, a silky oiliness that is actually extremely creepy. This is very old wine. I hope you will like it. Lugosi could barely speak English and had learned many of his lines as a stage actor, phonetically, uh, which gave him extraordinary powers of concentration. There's very little that's spontaneous or haphazard. It's an extraordinary, concentrated performance. It's almost like a ritual or a mime. It's the darkest romance you can imagine, but nevertheless, there is this, this almost matinee idol quality to, to some of what he brings to the part. He identified himself absolutely, totally with the part, and I think that this is, this is what, what, what gives Lugosi's performance as Dracula its great, great power and its ability to last, is that there's no distance, I don't think, between Lugosi and his character, his role in this film. He is Dracula. <laughs> the way that the film was sold, the strangest passion of all time. This is clearly the hook on which Lugosi hangs his performance. It's positioned, I think, precisely halfway between um, silent cinema and sound cinema. And the great opportunity for directors of this generation was that they had a medium that, that they could make it up as they went along. There were no real rules. You've got the combination of Todd Browning on the one hand, who clearly was fascinated by the dark side of humanity and the other, the, the outsider figure, and, and Lugosi bringing this sort of commitment to his performance. I think it gives the film a, an extraordinary presence and an extraordinary kind of otherworldliness that really is, I think, heightened by the relative absence of dialogue. Browning, of course, had an eye for the macabre and the sinister, having worked with Cheney. Beta Lugosi was in the right place at the right time, and this was his moment in time. He spotted what we now find obvious in Lugosi's screen persona. It really defined the whole era as far as the kind of horror tragic hero that Lugosi personified in that film. The end of the Dracula, it turns out Dracula is a vampire. And now that seems the most natural thing in the world. But the fact that Dracula clicked meant that now it was part of a whole new genre. There was another genre it could be part of, the, the horror film. Once Lugosi became Dracula in 1931, in the public's mind, that's what Dracula was. If the first Dracula had not been successful, there wouldn't have been another one. But because it was successful, there was another, and another, and another. People associated Count Dracula with that look forever. It was, it just, it was so strong that you couldn't exorcise it ever again. It was hypnotic, and you, you, you hear all these accounts of how women would kind of faint in the cinema when Dracula first, it completely different. He's a lounge lizard rather than a military lizard, which he is in the original story. So the folklore Dracula has gone. That's a hell of a thing to have done. And when you look at the circumstances they were made in, a lot of it was accidental, I think. For the first time in history, the American horror movie is born. One of the big stories that's in all the biographies, and Lugosi particularly told it often and often, was how he made Karloff by turning down the role of the Frankenstein monster. Carl Lemley Jr. was not going to hire Robert Florey to direct Frankenstein. But he did want Bela Lugosi to play the monster. That's when Flory did the screen test on a leftover set from Dracula, which was the creation of the monster. And he had Edward Van Sloan as Dr. Waldman. He had Dwight Fry as Fritz. I don't know who he had as Dr. Frankenstein. And he had Bela Lugosi as the monster. 
who basically just laid on the slab and opened his eyes. When Carl Lemley Jr. came back and saw that screen test, he didn't like it. As a matter of fact, the story is that when he saw Lugosi in his makeup, he laughed. This was a great scar for Beta Lugosi. It hurt him. And he spent the rest of his life really telling people that he had turned the role down. The idea that coming off a big hit, Lugosi would turn down the lead role in a major studio picture for any reason uh, is just absurd. It may have been that if he'd worked on his Frankenstein's monster, he, he might have actually, you know, pretty well uh, cornered the, the, the market in, in, in monsters at Universal. There was no contract offered him by Universal, as there was for Karloff after Frankenstein, so he was kind of forced to go out into the marketplace and take what he could get. <laughs> Lugosi goes off with Robert Florey to make The Murders in the Rue Morgue, which is a terrific film, but it's very much in the shadow of Frankenstein. Lugosi throws himself into the role of the mad doctor in Murders in the Rue Morgue with such passion. He's fascinating to watch. He's almost savage on screen. A lady in distress? Who are you? Come with me. It always reminds me that horror movies are brilliant at carrying taboo themes. And because they're horror movies, nobody notices. I mean, this film is about bestiality. It's about someone, Dr. Miracle, who wants to prove in a literal way the truth of Darwin's great chain of being and uh, natural selection by mating an ape with a human being, Eric the Ape. He likes you, Camille. Look, he wants your bond. Eric is only human about Muslim. It's an eye for beauty. And it's all covered over with uh, swapping blood. But, you know, when Eric stands over the bed and sort of drags the woman away, this is a movie about bestiality, which is an incredible... T today it's a huge taboo, let alone in, in 1932. <coughs> I think it's a wonderful performance. He looks good, too. His curly hair and sort of carnival outfit. A very underrated performance. How many actors could talk to an orangutan in a cage? and make it convincing. I mean the prime of my strength. And I'm lonely. You can't help but buy it, because he believes it. And he believes it so passionately, he makes you believe it. I tell you, I will prove your kinship with the ape. He departed Universal after Murders in the Room Morgue, and basically, again, unfortunately, was in a position to have to take what he could get. One of the things that he got was White Zombie. What other film could use just the actor's eyes to overlay uh, for emotional effect over a scene? He played the role of Murder Legendre, the zombie master. You watch that film and you think, nobody else could really make this picture work. Lugosi went into Island of Lost Souls in the fall of 1932, right about the time that he declared bankruptcy and was basically taking any job that came along. What was probably going through his head on the set at Paramount at that point was, I'm going to show everybody I can be a big hit in makeup too, just like Carla was as the monster. But unfortunately, the role was not that big. It didn't give him that much scope, so he was kind of shuffled off into the corner there. Even though his time on screen is very limited, what he does in that movie is frightening. Stop! The house of pain! Universal clearly saw early on in the, in the horror boom that if one monster was good, two were probably more than twice as good. These two absolutely iconic images are going to be put together in a film. You actually get Frankenstein and Dracula together. The Black Cat, first of all, as a movie, is a masterpiece. And one of the main reasons is because of the casting. Lugosi, cast against type, brings a lot to that role because Lugosi himself, as an actor, is very strong. He's very masculine. He's very controlling. And Dr. Vitas Verdigas, the psychiatrist, uh, he could have been played as a very tortured man. Lugosi gets the tortured part, but he emphasizes stuff that I don't think that Karloff in the, in the same role would have emphasized. I, too, am going very near there. For the sport? Perhaps. I go to visit an old friend. That fierce passion for revenge, and yet the desire not to hurt anybody except the one he wants to revenge against. His part was completely revamped, 
after the original version of the picture was shot, in which he and Karloff were both villains, they decided that they had to lighten up the movie because it was just too horrible. Uh, and so they reshot a, a good portion of it to make Bella the hero. And people grumble about, well, oh, geez, they probably ruined it. Well, actually, it's a terrific movie. And Lugosi's great on it. It's one of his best performances. Where is she? Fetus, you are mad. Where is she? I think there is nothing else that Lugosi does that really quite matches the moment at the end of The Black Cat, uh, where he, he goes crazy and uh, begins to skin Boris Karloff alive, begins to skin his enemy Hjalmar alive, and this suave, smooth, cultured individual for whom we have felt nothing but sympathy and pity throughout the film. And all of a sudden we see this enraged, insane madman underneath who's, who will commit this appalling, atrocious act. And it's not that it isn't justified in some crazy, insane way, given the craziness of the film generally, but that it is so monstrous. Did you ever see an animal skin, Hjalmar? <laughs> That's what I'm going to do to you now. Fell the skin from your body. Slowly, bit by bit. You suddenly think, I've got it all wrong. He's, he's the mentalist. He's quite sane, really. Compared to him, this is the nuts. We're seeing two of the greats of the horror cinema uh, for the first time, you know, up there against each other. It's 60-odd minutes of, uh, of absolute delirium and delight. The only movie that gives off sort of evil vibes is The Black Hat. There's a sense, a palpable sense of evil in that picture, which uh, is quite remarkable. The red switch ignites the dynamite. <laughs> Karloff and Lugosi really are rivals. Lugosi always called himself Karloff's rival in his lifetime, but actually there was a big gulf between the two as far as box office power and salary and billing and all that sort of thing. What's interesting to me is that although Karloff obviously won, you know, in, in career terms, that in the films they're more evenly matched. Dr. Benet, we meet at last. But we already know each other. True. If given the opportunity, Lugosi can steal scenes from Karloff. You can probably understand why, why Lugosi wanted to be, in a, in a sense, the screen nemesis of, 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 of Karloff. You have never seen eye to eye. That is because I've always looked 200 years ahead of your theories. Finding how many syllables you can get in, in an apparently one or two syllable word, that was his favourite trick. And OK, that was his accent, but he knew how to play it. You can only live if you use a small amount of it at regular intervals each day, all the days of your life. It's a simple question of linguistic competence. He may have been the world's greatest Hungarian actor, but he died the world's greatest Hungarian actor. At midnight we bolt all doors and darken the entire house. His face and hands will appear like, like phosphorus, regardless of any disguise. And, uh, if he touches anyone, <laughs> they die. I can change your face. Then do it. It isn't plastic surgery, but there is a way. The interesting one is The Raven, which is a Lugosi movie where Karloff is the stooge. Where, in fact, quite a lot of the film is about Lugosi tormented Karloff and doing terrible things. To and actually, that's one of the great Lugosi performances. I mean, it's probably his best villain role in that, that he gets to do more evil things. Lugosi's playing Vol in this deranged, Poe-obsessed surgeon who has a, a torture chamber in his basement. The way they play off against each other there, again, is, I think, it's extraordinarily powerful. You're monstrously ugly. Your monstrous ugliness breeds monstrous hate. Good. The ghost really yeah, tears that one off. The <laughs> ghost <laughs> unhinged is just about the, the most sinister thing you can see when he's given an all-out evil character, he plays it. He doesn't ask for sympathy. 
He brings the strength. He brings the stature. He brings that dark quality from his own personality. And he imbues the character that's written to be evil anyway with almost a, a satanic quality that goes beyond the human. There's even a line where the woman is admiring him while he's playing the organ. You're not only a great surgeon, but a great musician too. And she says, it's almost as if you're not, and he finishes the sentence for it. A God? Yes. A God with the taint of human emotions. The film that ran into the greatest problems with the British censor, actually, at the time, and pretty well uh, was responsible for, for, for bringing the, the first horror boom to, to an end. If you touch that switch, Bateman, I'll not fix you. No. You stay the way you are, Bateman. By the time he's reached Mark the Vampire, which is only four years after Dracula, his career is already on the way in. He's already on the way out. He went back to the, he's not really a vampire, it's all a, all a con, which now seems really strange, but that was the default ending of these stories. Certainly, I prefer his performance in Mark of the Vampire to his performance in Dracula in many ways, because I think he's a much creepier, scarier, unnerving character as a vampire, even though he doesn't say anything, except for the very end. Um, it's, it's very much a lesser role. Uh, for him. I mean, he's off to the side, it's a cameo. He's already starting to trade on that image four years later. Carol Borland, who played his daughter, his vampire daughter, said he was the most sexually attractive man she ever saw. She said when Bela Lugosi walked into a room, everybody knew it. All eyes turned to him, conversation hushed, and it all became about, oh, that's Bela Lugosi. It's probably one of the last major movies from a major studio he would appear in for the rest of his career. The stigma of Dracula really did haunt Lugosi, and come the late 30s, he really had a very hard time finding work in Hollywood. In fact, he had three different agents in three years because of the fact that nobody could deliver the goods for him as far as getting him work. He lost his home in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, he found himself, as he put it, an out-of-work spook. He seems to have no sense of his own worth as an actor and that basically doomed his career. The voice and the facial expressions, which are almost mask-like, uh, limited his range as an actor. Lugosi just wasn't that lucky, I guess. Uh, I mean, so whatever he did after that, they, they say, well, he wasn't as good as he was in Dracula. That was the high point of his career. One of Lugosi's greatest performances is in Son of Frankenstein which is a picture that was made uh, by a very iconoclastic director named Roland V. Lee, who seemed to not give a fig what the studio thought about what was going on. And he was apparently uh, rather outraged that, that Lugosi was being paid so little money. And he made a decision not to shoot him out and to keep him on the picture and probably built up his part somewhat. And uh, it's, an, it's an amazing performance. It's a terrific performance. Frankenstein, like your father, eh? Yes. I can't mend a broken neck. Nobody can mend Igor's neck. It's all right. It was certainly his greatest acting performance. Magnificent performance. And it really blew up the myth that all he could ever play was Dracula. This was a character about as far away from Dracula as you could ever imagine. Dracula would never bite the broken neck of Igor. I think this is a one chance he has to to, yeah, to be a proper stage type actor in, in movies. And I think that there's a, a delight in that performance. Nobody else could play the role. I mean, he, he, even dare we say, he almost supplants Dwight Fry's uh, assistant to Frankenstein in, in the first film. <laughs> they die dead. I die live. <laughs> There must also be a kind of delight in, in the fact that he's in a film finally and Karloff has the boring role. The monster isn't very interesting in Son of Frankenstein. Everyone else is good. Eight men say Igor hanged. Now eight men dead. All dead. He has a kind of peasant um, warmth to him that you didn't think Lugosi had because he wasn't cast in parts like that. It shows that if given the chance, he really could have been a very, very fine, effective character actor who delivered the goods. But somehow uh, the word didn't get round and he was just indelibly a set, do Dracula, everyone would go out to him, do Dracula. In the late 1930s, early 1940s, Universal saw Beta Lugosi as a featured player and he had supporting roles in films like Black Friday and The Wolfman 
and uh, he was Igor again in The Ghost of Frankenstein, but again, even then, that was a, considered a, a supporting role. Suddenly, the, the, the clearest example, I think, of, of not so much Lugosi's limitations as an actor, but simply the fact that however well he might act, uh, you, you're going to hear Lugosi, and perhaps by now you're going to hear Dracula, uh, is his gangster in that very strange film, Black Friday. But what about our dough? We ain't got it back yet. Yeah. Yeah, how about it? Mr. DeVore, it would have been poor business to kill Red unless I knew how to locate the money. What you hear is, is Dracula in a, a gangster suit. In the subsequent pictures, Lugosi starts declining. He is getting more and more sidekick or stooge or victim parts. Obviously Val Luton brought him back for the body snatcher and, and paired him once more with Karloff. And for his basically a cameo role, he gives a really great performance. Unfortunately, concurrently with these kind of films, he was churning out these poverty row films for Monogram and PRC, where he, although he got top billing in the films and he is ostensibly the star of these films, they were poverty row quickies that were shot in three or four days where he would be demeaned to the state of having to wear you know, gorilla suits and run around and scare Una Merkel and people like this. And the double that, which is, you know, a, a, a triumph. I mean, look, it's, it's using, he's great in this movie. There's a sour irony to the way he plays the part that I find just irresistible. It's not a look of condescension. It's a look of they don't know what they've got trapped in this nonsense. I'm Bella Lugosi. I can't imagine what he felt as an actor. Did he feel that maybe his career was over and he just we got to take the money and run. The appeal, obviously, of doing the PRC and monogram pictures was that, you know, he was the star. Clearly, he was very much bigger than almost anything else around him in those movies, in including, <laughs> dare we say, the sets. Most of those films would be agonizingly unwatchable without him. The reason they're fascinating, primarily, is because he is the whole show. There are very few who can just completely you know, take a film where everything else is bad and still make it something that you'll find yourself watching once a year for the rest of your life. He would take smaller roles in, in B-movies, especially for Universal. So he would turn up as Bella the Gypsy in, in The Wolfman because it's a great role for him. It's a good signature role. He's working with real actors and real budgets, and um, he's very good in it. What did you see? Something evil? No, no. Now go away. Go quickly. Go! Yes. In the series, The Ghost of Frankenstein, Lon Chaney Jr. had played the monster, and it ended with Igor's brain being transferred into the skull of the monster, Igor being Bela Lugosi. The monster, played by Lon Chaney Jr., is now talks, and he's got Lugosi's voice, which is actually a very creepy, great moment in that picture. What have I done? I'm Igor. I have the strength of a hundred men. I cannot die! I cannot be destroyed! I, Igor, will live forever! So I think they figured, well, okay, now look, Lugosi's essentially the monster now, so let's have him play the monster in the next picture, which is Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. But because of his health and his frail nature and the fact that he had to be doubled through, you know, half the picture, worse, Part of the plot is that he went blind in the last movie from the wrong blood type, and so he plays the part correctly. He plays it as if he's blind. And this is where the, the, the cliché of the shambling monster whose arms are sticking out came from, because that's the way the ghost he played it, because he was supposed to be blind. And he talked at the end of the previous picture, so he, he speaks and has lines in this picture. So the story goes that they showed the movie, and everybody laughed at his Hungarian accent. Uh, which doesn't really make sense because he's actually Igor. But for whatever reason, they decided they were going to cut all of his dialogue and all the references to him being blind. And worse, the guys who doubled him in stuff that must have been shot later, they doubled him as if they could see. So unfortunately, even though the movie is extremely well directed and, and beautifully photographed, Frankenstein meets the wolf, man, it, it kind of doesn't make sense on a lot of levels because of a lot of the editorial interference. Something slightly pathetic um, about Lugosi's monster when he finally gets around to playing it. I don't think it helped him at Universal. I'm sure that they, look, somebody had to blame. <laughs> That's one of the great things about the movies is, you know, who can you blame? You know, when something's wrong, you gotta blame somebody. And I think he was in a position where it was pretty safe to blame him. And so he didn't work for Universal again until Abigail Stoller meet Frankenstein, which was, you know, a different, actually a different regime.
And even that, I mean, it's a stooge role to, to comedy characters, isn't it? What's interesting is, you know, Abbott and Costello do their routines, but Lugosi does, he, he gets this one more chance to do his role absolutely straight. Look into my eyes. Look. kind of moving as well as anything else. His playing is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a revival of the, the role that he knew was, was always his, and maybe there's almost that sense that, you know, he was, he was making that one last bid to establish that nobody else could play it. He's wearing a little bit too much makeup, but you can see this is a guy who is royalty. He's used to be treated as the most important guy in the room. He is Count Dracula, even though he's aged. Abbott and Costello throwing pies at each other between scenes and all this madness going on on the soundstage. And here's Lugosi having to try to recreate this character among, this, among these, all these crazy things going on around him. But he did it, and he had a very good time. <laughs> After Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Lugosi's fortunes um, in terms of opportunities in the movies fell. Lugosi in later years didn't have nearly as much good fortune to be able to work on stage, although he did lots of summer stock appearances in Dracula and Ars Nugget Old Lace. I became friendly with him and was able to arrange for a provincial tour of Dracula to be set up in England, which went quite well. And while he was there, I was able also to set up a film titled Vampire Over London, in which he played a role that was a sort of spoof of his Dracula character. And he was very amusing in it, and he did it very well. When you get to the Ed Wood period, it gets, it gets a little too poignant for me. I mean, if you look at Bride of the Monster, which I don't recommend, but if you do look at Bride of the Monster, he's giving it his all. A very funny film in the way that only Edwards' his very best, which is to say his most incompetent, can be. Vela, with all respect to Edward and those movies, was a, a sad way to end a, a career. Yet, of course, he's become even more iconic because of those films. That's one of the reasons fans love him, because Bela Lugosi never acted down to the material. I think it's wonderful that Lugosi received the tribute he did in Ed Wood, but it's also very sad to see, in a sense, Martin Landau, who's a wonderful actor and certainly nothing against him, standing on stage getting an Academy Award for pretending to be Beta Lugosi, whereas Beta Lugosi never received anything of, of that magnitude of respect in Hollywood in his career. I think the film, for me, has the same feel that you get from Targets for Karloff. It is your last chance of, of, of paying your respects to Lugosi. I bid you welcome. Lugosi is one of those actors who had one part in his life, yeah, that came along, completely transformed his career, uh, made him a star, and then became a millstone around his neck. I don't think he felt trapped in terms of regretting playing that role. I think had the horror genre offered him more roles, even if they were just like Dracula, he would have been thrilled to do it. There's just so many times in a decade you can make a Dracula picture. My blood now flows through her veins. She will live through the centuries to come, as I have lived. That is now the way we think of Dracula. It's the way adults think of Dracula. It's the way children think of Dracula, with that accent, with that look. It's Lugosi we remember walking through that cobweb somehow or listening to the wolves outside in the night and, and many other great moments. It was the perfect marriage of actor and part. It was so strong that nothing can supplant it. His wife Lillian said that I wish you could have seen him on stage as Dracula. He was like a great animal, but you didn't pull the whiskers because any minute he could pounce. So there was a mixture of the charm and of the beast in him. And this is something that later horror films have built on and capitalized on for decades. And they owe it all to this uh, Lugosi persona. Some people could call it hammy, but I don't think so. I, I think there's a body language, there's a grace to him. There's a grace and an animal confidence. I think with Bela Lugosi, they enjoyed more the vicarious thrill of seeing someone being completely evil 
and all of us succeeding with it. Partly nostalgia is at the root of why, of why Dracula is still, is still popular. I mean, it, it, it's a great black and white horror movie, particularly in the most anthologizable moments. You cannot think of anybody but Lugosi with those lines. And I think you can never really think of anybody but Lugosi in that cape either. No wonder he was, he was buried with it. And you watch him even in those very, very lamentable films. He's still playing as if he's playing Shakespeare. He's still acting as if this is the greatest script in the world. He's still acting with the, the, the actor's dream concept that somewhere in the world, somebody who needs entertainment is watching me in this movie. And for that poor soul, I'm gonna give him or her everything I've got. Thank <laughs> you.